from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard. Or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood. And they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ, he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross. And it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. 
The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sins and your sins. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died and the people laughed and sneered and two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him they were both mocking him but one of them became strangely silent and finally this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air the murderer and said we are dying justly we deserve to be crucified but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the books, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. 
They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good works. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he'd ever committed, wiped the slate clean, and he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment, and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. 
I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight, and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them, God remembers them and God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily beset you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you die. It's all there. It's all in the record books, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sin. I've committed plenty of sins in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, he that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. 
I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. I'm going to ask you to come right now, men, women, young people. God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget it. I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ and said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you and many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. Now I want to say a word to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven you want to know you're going to heaven, you want a new direction in your life, and you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sin and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past and from tonight on there are four things that are very important first read your bible every day we're going to give you a gospel of john we want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the bible we're going to give you a bible study we're going to give you some verses of scripture to learn memorize this helps you to grow desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby the scripture says you cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're his child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayers. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer. And pray about everything, whatever the details are. Nothing is too small to bring to God's attention. And then thirdly, witness for Christ. How do you witness? You witness by the smile on your face. You witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory, the new attitude you have toward work, the new attitude you have in the home. And then you witness by going to somebody of another race and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be. But he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. 
from this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. Now I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Exodus, the third chapter of Exodus. Now Moses had been called of God out of a burning bush, a bush that wouldn't burn. The fire was there, but not the bush, the bush was still there. And Moses went over to investigate, and God said, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh that he must let the people go. They've been held in slavery and bondage for nearly 400 years. You tell them, you tell Pharaoh that he has to let them go. And Moses was very disturbed about it and frightened and nervous. And he said, what if the people of Israel that are working down there as slaves won't have me as their leader? Who should I tell them I am and who you are? They don't even know who you are. And God replied and said to Moses, tell them that I am, that I am. I am sent you. That means from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. He is I am. There are many things about that that we don't understand. Where did God come from? Do you ever ask yourself that question? How did God get all this power that he could create all these galaxies out there? Where did God get all this tenderness and love that he would send his son to die on a cross for us? We ask ourselves those questions. He said, I am. And in the New Testament, in the book of John, seven times, Jesus said, I am. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. Jesus told us who he was. The first thing he said, he said, I am the bread of life. Now, the whole world searches for bread. Bread and rice, I found out in my tours of Asia, that rice is the staff of life to them as bread is to us. And Jesus said, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. Think of it. If you come to Christ, you will never hunger. What does he mean by that? Both bread and rice are the staff of life. And Jesus had a great compassion for the hungry. And we should too. We're taking up food here tonight and clothes for people that are hungry. I don't have enough clothes for the winter. And I hope you will have a part in this Love in Action program. And that's what we all should be doing all the time. Jesus said, I was a hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you to drink? We don't remember that. But Jesus had a greater concern for the soul hunger. A prominent doctor said some time ago, more people die of loneliness, guilt, depression, tension, insecurity, and of heart hunger 
than die of physical starvation. And how true that is. Bread in the scriptures is often the symbol of spiritual life. Man has an inborn hunger for God. We're born with a hunger for God. We don't know that it's a hunger for God. And millions of people around the world are seeking something. That's the reason we have so many religions in the world. People are seeking something. They're not quite sure what. And they cannot be satisfied with anything less than God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He can come into your life and touch every area of your life, including your married life, your sex life, your economic life, your love life, whatever it is. He can come in and he can give you total satisfaction if you let him. He said, I'm the living bread. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he will live forever. You say, well, how do you do that? It's so complicated. No, he said, the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus' first sermon had to do with repentance. Change your way of living. Change your mind. And live for God. Then secondly, Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. With all of our scientific knowledge, we don't really have a precise definition of light. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I read it in a scientific magazine. While we do not know all about what light is, we do know many of its effects. We know that there could be no plant, animal, or human life on this planet without light. God put the sun in a precise balance and distance from this world. And we would all die were it not for that sunlight. And what the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The first thing that light does is reveal. It reveals when you can see in your heart, you'll find that you too have sinned against God. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And do you know something? Gather all the darkness in the whole world and it cannot put out the light of a single candle. Go into a closet and get yourself a big bag and try to capture all the darkness you can and carry it out and put it on that candle. It won't go out. The candle reveals what's in the darkness. Christ wants to turn on his light in your heart and he wants all of us to be reflectors of his light. I read about a man who went into his basement and found some potatoes had sprouted in the darkest corner of the room. At first, he couldn't figure out what had happened until he heard that his wife had scrubbed a copper kettle and hung it from the ceiling near the window. And she kept the kettle so brightly polished that it reflected the rays of the sun on those potatoes and they sprouted. We should all be like that copper kettle, catching the rays of Jesus Christ and reflecting his light to someone in a dark corner. There's a woman in New York City and several times a year I go to New York and she sits on that same corner all the time during the winter. And I've passed her many times and I've stopped and talked to her and gotten to know her a little bit and I always give her some money. And several times lately she said, no, I don't want your money, Brother Graham. She said, they, they, they keep me up. I just want you to give me something of Jesus. And of course I talked to her about Christ and about the Lord. But we should all be reflecting the light 
of the Lord Jesus Christ and the way we live. God needs our light where the world is the darkest, the blacker the night, the greater the need for a light bulb. If the bulb doesn't shine, it's not because of the darkness. Darkness can't put out any light. If the darkness increases until it is black as a cave, it is still not dark enough to extinguish a light. No one has yet smothered a light by increasing the darkness. Darkness gets darker because the light fails. When we fail to reflect Christ's light, we let the darkness win. And here, Jesus also said, thirdly, I am the door in John 10, 9. Now every house and every building has an entrance. This dome has several entrances. The kingdom of God has an entrance too. It's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. There's only one door in God's kingdom. And that door is Jesus. He, he knew a lot about doors because he was a carpenter and he had made a lot of doors. And while a building may have several entrances, the kingdom of God has only one. Have you come to that door? And when you come to that door, you must stoop and confess and acknowledge that you have failed morally and spiritually and that you have sinned against God. You've broken his commandments and you're sorry for it. And you're willing to change your way of life. Have you been through that door? Jesus stands there beckoning, calling you with his arms outstretched and he calls you from the cross. You see, he came not to be born as we celebrate at Christmas time. He came to die. That was his purpose in coming. He came to die for you and for me on that cross. And he didn't die just physically. Oh, they, it's one of the most horrible deaths that you can ever think about is the cross where you may hang there lingering for several days. The soldiers were gambling for his garment. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He'd been rejected. But he stayed on that cross when they yelled for him to come down because if he had come down, the door would have been closed. There'd have been no way for any of us to ever get to heaven or to have our sins forgiven. He stayed on the cross for you. Then he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that mysterious moment that no theologian knows exactly what happened, he took our sins. God laid on him every sin that you have ever committed and every sin I've committed. All the thoughts and the intents of your life, the things you've done, the things that you've thought that are wrong. He took it on that cross. And because he did it, he can say, I forgive you. Your sins are gone forever. Are you certain that you're ready? You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of sin. That means that you're willing to say to God, I am a sinner and I'm willing to change my way of living. You can't change your way of living, but God will help you to do it. He has to help you to repent. You don't have the strength to repent. And then the second thing is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the scripture says. But that word believe means a great deal more than just believing with your head. When I walked on this platform the other night, I didn't check it out to see if it'd hold a man. I knew that the carpenters had built it to hold a man. I believed and I put my full weight on this platform. You ought to put your full weight on Christ and say, I'm trusting him and him alone for my salvation. And then the third thing, you must be willing to obey him.
Now I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Exodus. The third chapter of Exodus. Now Moses had been called of God out of a burning bush, a bush that wouldn't burn. The fire was there, but not the bush. The bush was still there. And Moses went over to investigate. And God said, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh that he must let the people go. They've been held in slavery and bondage for nearly 400 years. You tell them, you tell Pharaoh that he has to let them go. And Moses was very disturbed about it and frightened and nervous. And he said, what if the people of Israel that are working down there as slaves won't have me as their leader? Who should I tell them I am and who you are? They don't even know who you are. And God replied and said to Moses, tell them that I am, that I am. I am sent you. That means from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. He is I am. There are many things about that that we don't understand. Where did God come from? Do you ever ask yourself that question? How did God get all this power that he could create all these galaxies out there? Where did God get all this tenderness and love that he would send his son to die on a cross for us? We ask ourselves those questions. He said, I am. And in the New Testament, in the book of John, seven times, Jesus said, I am. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. Jesus told us who he was. The first thing he said, he said, I am the bread of life. Now, the whole world searches for bread. Bread and rice, I found out in my tours of Asia, that rice is the staff of life to them as bread is to us. And Jesus said, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. Think of it. If you come to Christ, you will never hunger. What does he mean by that? Both bread and rice are the staff of life. And Jesus had a great compassion for the hungry. And we should too. We're taking up food here tonight and clothes for people that are hungry. I don't have enough clothes for the winter. And I hope you will have a part in this Love in Action program. And that's what we all should be doing all the time. Jesus said, I was a hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you? Or thirsty and gave you to drink. We don't remember that. But Jesus had a greater concern for the soul hunger. A prominent doctor said some time ago, more people die of loneliness, guilt, depression, tension, insecurity, and of heart hunger than die of physical starvation. And how true that is. Bread in the scriptures is often the symbol of spiritual life. Man has an inborn hunger for God. We're born with a hunger for God. We don't know that it's a hunger for God. And millions of people around the world are seeking something. That's the reason we have so many religions in the world. People are seeking something. They're not quite sure what. And they cannot be satisfied with anything less than God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He can come into your life 
and touch every area of your life, including your married life, your sex life, your economic life, your love life, whatever it is. He can come in and he can give you total satisfaction if you let him. He said, I'm the living bread. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he will live forever. You say, well, how do you do that? It's so complicated. No, he said, the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus' first sermon had to do with repentance. Change your way of living, change your mind and live for God. Then secondly, Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. With all of our scientific knowledge, we don't really have a precise definition of light. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I read it in a scientific magazine. While we do not know all about what light is, we do know many of its effects. We know that there could be no plant, animal, or human life on this planet without light. God put the sun in a precise balance and distance from this world. And we would all die were it not for that sunlight. And what the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The first thing that light does is reveal. It reveals when you can see in your heart, you'll find that you too have sinned against God. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And do you know something? Gather all the darkness in the whole world and it cannot put out the light of a single candle. Go into a closet and get yourself a big bag and try to capture all the darkness you can and carry it out and put it on that candle. It won't go out. The candle reveals what's in the darkness. Christ wants to turn on his light in your heart and he wants all of us to be reflectors of his light. I read about a man who went into his basement and found some potatoes had sprouted in the darkest corner of the room. At first, he couldn't figure out what had happened until he heard that his wife had scrubbed a copper kettle and hung it from the ceiling near the window. And she kept the kettle so brightly polished that it reflected the rays of the sun on those potatoes and they sprouted. We should all be like that copper kettle, catching the rays of Jesus Christ and reflecting his light to someone in a dark corner. There's a woman in New York City and several times a year I go to New York and she sits on that same corner all the time during the winter. And I've passed her many times and I've stopped and talked to her and gotten to know her a little bit and I always give her some money. And several times lately she said, no, I don't want your money, Brother Graham. She said, they, they, they keep me up. I just want you to give me something of Jesus. And of course I talked to her about Christ and about the Lord. But we should all be reflecting the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and the way we live. God needs our light where the world is the darkest, the blacker the night, the greater the need for a light bulb. If the bulb doesn't shine, it's not because of the darkness. Darkness can't put out any light. If the darkness increases until it is black as a cave, it is still not dark enough to extinguish a light. No one has yet smothered a light by increasing the darkness. Darkness gets darker because the light fails. When we fail to reflect Christ's light, we let the darkness win. And Jesus also said, 
Thirdly, I am the door in John 10, 9. Now, every house and every building has an entrance. This dome has several entrances. The kingdom of God has an entrance, too. It's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. There's only one door in God's kingdom, and that door is Jesus. He, he knew a lot about doors because he was a carpenter, and he had made a lot of doors. And while a building may have several entrances, the kingdom of God has only one. Have you come to that door? And when you come to that door, you must stoop and confess and acknowledge that you have failed morally and spiritually and that you have sinned against God. You've broken his commandments and you're sorry for it and you're willing to change your way of life. Have you been through that door? Jesus stands there beckoning, calling you with his arms outstretched, and he calls you from the cross. You see, he came not to be born as we celebrate at Christmas time. He came to die. That was his purpose in coming. He came to die for you and for me on that cross. And he didn't die just physically. Oh, they. It's one of the most horrible deaths that you can ever think about is the cross where you may hang there lingering for several days. The soldiers were gambling for his garment. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He'd been rejected. But he stayed on that cross when they yelled for him to come down because if he'd come down, the door would have been closed. There'd have been no way for any of us to ever get to heaven or to have our sins forgiven. He stayed on the cross for you. Then he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that mysterious moment that no theologian knows exactly what happened, he took our sins. God laid on him every sin that you have ever committed and every sin I've committed. All the thoughts and the intents of your life, the things you've done, the things that you've thought that are wrong. He took it on that cross. And because he did it, he can say, I forgive you. Your sins are gone forever. Are you certain that you're ready? You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of sin. That means that you're willing to say to God, I am a sinner and I'm willing to change my way of living. You can't change your way of living, but God will help you to do it. He has to help you to repent. You don't have the strength to repent. And then the second thing is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, the Scripture says. But that word believe means a great deal more than just believing with your head. When I walked on this platform the other night, I didn't check it out to see if it would hold a man. I knew that the carpenters had built it to hold a man. I believed, and I put my full weight on this platform. You ought to put your full weight on Christ and say, I'm trusting him and him alone for my salvation. And then the third thing, you must be willing to obey him.